Week four, a highly unusual Sunday in court in the case of the People versus O.J. Simpson. The jurors get a break from the isolation of their hotel rooms. They travel to Nicole Brown's condo, the murder scene, the restaurant where Ron Goldman worked, and O.J.'s house on Rockingham Avenue, where he returns not as the man who lives there, but as a prisoner on trial for his life. I'm Roger Cossack, and this is O.J. 25. The court's purpose in going here is to allow the jurors to see the scene as close to reality as is possible without any, any interpretation put on it by either party. Mr. Cochran, do you want to address that issue? Sure. At no time has Mr. Simpson ever desired uh, to go to or be at the Bundy scene. It's painful for him as it is for the Brown family. And accordingly, he plans to stay in the, uh, in the vehicle at that location. Mr. Uh, Simpson, this is a court proceeding that will be conducted in the field. You have the right to be present at any time when the jury is receiving evidence and actually viewing the crime scene, obviously, is the receipt of evidence since they'll be seeing uh, locations that are relevant to this case. Uh, my understanding is that you are willing to waive and give up your right to be present at the Bundy address while the jury is conducting their view of the scene. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you the uh, purpose of our court session here today. We are going to go out to four locations that are relevant to the facts and issues of this case. We will have to actually block streets. Uh, to allow us and you to have a view of these locations without any in interference from any outside influences. The motorcade has left the criminal courthouse in downtown Los Angeles, headed for Brentwood. There are 14 vehicles in this entourage. There are dozens of police officers, half a dozen helicopters, and scores of spectators. Jurors are not allowed to talk to each other, but they can take notes. The bus loaded with 12 jurors and nine alternates stops at Ron Goldman's apartment for fewer than two minutes. That one right here. That one. The purpose? So they can see how close it is to the crime scene. Right there in the corner where the San Vicente street sign is. Yeah. For about two minutes, they stopped by Metzaluna, the place where Ron Goldman worked. Then another very short drive, just about six to eight blocks down Bundy to Nicole Simpson's condo. Escorted by bailiffs, the jury gets off the bus and walks along the front walkway, the side pathway, the inside of the condo, and along the back alley. They stood in the same place where Nicole Brown Simpson's body was found and where Ronald Goldman was found. It's almost an eerie feeling, I think, to stand at the scene of death. The O.J. Simpson entourage has made its way into Brentwood and to the Rockingham drive a state of O.J. Simpson. Rockingham was a beautiful place, big, sprawling. The jury walks around outside, goes into the guest house where Cato Kalin stayed, and then inside where O.J. lived. But once they get inside, they see a home that is barely recognizable, even to O.J. Simpson. The reaction to the actual visit to Rockingham did surprise the, the prosecution because and they were, it, it angered the prosecution. The house did seem to be rearranged. There was a little more football memorabilia than maybe there had been uh, been previously. Uh, the prosecution screamed that we were trying to change O.J.'s image. Well, yes, we were. Should they have done that? Oh, probably not. Should Judge Ito have known about it uh, and stopped it? I would think so, and I certainly understand why the prosecution was upset. Now, remember, they didn't destroy evidence. Uh, that was crucial to the case. They didn't hide evidence. They just rearranged the decorations uh, in Simpson's house. I would have argued uh, that you're giving a false impression uh, by changing things, but I'm not sure I would have been successful. I think it was evident that O.J. Simpson was pleased to be home. He was home but not free. 
He was there with deputies around him. He was not particularly heavily guarded, but he knew that certainly there were people there who were ultimately going to take him back to prison. So if the killer wasn't a dog, then somebody had to go out the back end, didn't they? The following program contains graphic images. Viewer discretion is advised. Collection of evidence is pretty straightforward. Were there mistakes made? Sure. Are there always mistakes made? Yeah, there are. But they're humans. And you have to say, is it a reasonable mistake? Does it look like there's any nefarious plot going on here to frame O.J. Simpson? And if there's not, can we dismiss or discount this mistake as just being an honest mistake? Or was it for a purpose? Sergeant Rossi, would you come over here and stand by the court will report it, please? Mr. Nephew, Dr. Trusen, help you Yes, I do. Please have a seat in the witness stand and state the first and last name. What were you able to see when the uh, flashlight was shined on the uh, victims? I saw a uh, female victim lying in a pool of blood. Uh, she appeared to be wearing a black dress. Uh, on the other side of her, I saw the male victim. She appeared to be in a semi-seating, slumped type of a position. There was a lot of blood there, and uh, in with the blood, there was a lot of, of dog prints. Paw prints? Yes. Did you see any shoe prints on that walkway? Towards the front of the, of the condominium, I observed some what appeared to be uh, bloody shoe sole prints on the ground, on, this, on the concrete. And which direction were those uh, shoe prints going, sir? They were going towards the rear of the condominium. And a direction that would be from where the victims lay out towards the rear gate? That's correct. And you didn't see any of those until you got halfway down? That's right. And did Lieutenant Spangler then walk into walk down the uh, walkway and look at the bloody shoe prints or oh, approach no. the bodies of the victims? No, he didn't do that. Why not? I think he accepted the explanation from uh, detective from both the detectives, and I don't think this was speculated. Sustain. Sustain. I knew what police were supposed to do at a crime scene, and simply took him through the routine and exercised him a little bit for breaching protocol, to put it nicely. In other words, sloppy damn police work. Sergeant Rossi, you, you said that you were familiar with certain parts of the health and safety code. Your Honor, may I please see what counsel's reading from? You already have at the bench. Oh, he smashed it out of my hands. Ms. Yes. Clark, have a seat, please. Do you remember the question, Sergeant? Yes, sir, I do. And yes, I am familiar with some sections. Did you, during that 45-minute period, have a legal duty to call the coroner? Not as far as I know, no. Did you know it was a misdemeanor to fail to call the coroner, Sergeant? I don't believe it is, sir. I thought that the entire crime scene had been very sloppily handled. Indeed, that was a theme throughout the case. Much of their evidence was contaminated before it ever got tested. There's nothing screwed up about that crime scene. Is it contaminated? I challenge anybody to tell me there was a crime scene that wasn't contaminated. All crime scenes are contaminated. Furthermore, there wasn't any question in your mind once Officer Risky had swept through the premises that the killers, whoever they were, were gone. True? That's correct. At large, on the loose, carrying with them in all probability some bloody evidence. Objection. True? Objection, killers, plural. Counsel's testifying. Sustain. Fact not evidence. Rephrase the question. Killer or killer. Are we restricted to the state's theory of one killer, erroneous no. though it may be? No, but the, the question yes, assumes... Hold on. Hold on. The question assumes a fact that's not in evidence we don't know. You can Very rephrase well. it properly as killer or killers. Fine. I accept that. Thank you. Can you tell us why it was that for the better part of an hour after you learn of a brutal homicide, you were not concerned about notifying the ex-husband? Because those types of notifications are done by the detectives. Oh, and until the detective comes on the scene, he stays at risk? Is that it? Well, if that's what you want to say, yes, that's, how, that's what we do. Why in the world did you need to go on the crime scene to begin with if you're not a detective? So I could give the responding detectives 
an accurate account of what was there. They require that from me. So when you go to a crime scene, just like the officer that first arrives there, you pick a path that will be repeated by everybody else. So your job is really important that you see what looks like evidence. So that is your absolutely number one priority, to preserve as much as you can as the suspect left it. And then you start documenting what you see there as obvious evidence. Wasn't the evidence staring you in the face that somebody had to go out the back? Well, like I said, it was outside, so... I understand. Didn't you tell us in your testimony that you saw tracks on the sidewalk on Bundy? He, on Bundy? Yes. Foot, uh, dog, dog tracks only. That's right. Yes. So if the killer wasn't a dog, then somebody had to go out the back end, didn't they? Sir, didn't they? They, could have, they could have gone any direction. Without leaving any footprints after being in all that blood, Sergeant? Well, that's, that's, that's possible, yes. And how is that possible? Please tell me. <laughs> to just leave and, and cover their tracks somehow. Leave and cover the yeah. tracks. Would you explain to all of us how that could be accomplished by well, a killer if, with bloody feet? If they didn't get blood on their feet, they wouldn't leave tracks. Having been at the scene, can you imagine that the perpetrator or perpetrators didn't get blood on their feet? Can you imagine that? There was a lot of blood there. No. Can you imagine that these murders were accomplished without getting any blood on the feet of the perpetrator? I think anything is possible. Anything is possible. So you think they may have been fast enough on their feet to avoid blood while accomplishing the carnage that we've been looking at on screen. Is that right? I can't accurately testify to that. I'm sorry. Oh, all right. And the jury's saying to itself, well, if they were sloppy in this area, how can we trust the other areas where they say they found evidence? Detective Phillips arrived at Bundy at 2.10 and didn't depart till 10 a.m. No, I didn't note that. You know that's false, don't you? No, sir, I don't know that's false. Didn't he call you from Rockingham? Yes, sir, he did. You now know it's false, don't you? Yes. Okay. The following program contains graphic images and language. Viewer discretion is advised. Why did you, after 5 o'clock in the morning, having not lifted a finger to notify Mr. Simpson for over four hours, suddenly declare an emergency. Francis Lee Bailey is born on June 10th, 1933, just outside Boston. He drops out of Harvard University to join the Marines and becomes a fighter pilot. Bailey attends Boston University Law School in 1957, where he achieves the highest grade point average in the school's history. He becomes famous as the attorney for Dr. Sam Shepard, who was accused of murdering his wife. When he joins O.J. Simpson's so-called dream team, Bailey is already a living legend. He's especially known for his larger-than-life courtroom presence when he cross-examines witnesses. At the age of 21, a local trial lawyer took me under his wing and began to explain to me the facts of life. And he said, cross-examination is something you have to grow into. No one will ever teach it to you, so you watch and you fashion your own technique, and then you polish and polish and polish. F. Lee Bailey, to all of us, I think, was like legendary. I mean, his reputation preceded him. We were excited to meet the great F. Lee Bailey. He was, in many ways, everything that we thought. He was larger than life. And, of course, that same entry as to Detective Furman would be wrong, wouldn't it? Possibly. It's not my job to review the crime scene log, sir. That goes to the detectives. Sorry. I thought you did review it. I looked at it. But because it was not your job, you didn't look at it carefully. Is that what you're telling me? I didn't scrutinize it, no. Okay. It was a bad job. Nobody denied it. People make mistakes all the time. When you have nothing else, you put the cops on, on trial. And that's, that's the only reason all this nonsense happened. So what if somebody didn't dot the I on the form that they filled out? So what if they didn't cross the T? Those things suddenly meant you weren't doing your job properly. Everything was translated in a negative way by the defense. Every day was more and more and more and more BS. And you throw enough of it out there and some of it's liable to stick. And it did. 
the witnesses, they all seem to come out of central casting. The police officers look like they were on Hawaii Five-0, right? You know, they look like cops. See, there's Lewis around 150 All right, records reflect that Robert Risky is still on the witness stand. Mr. Risky, you're advised that you are still under oath. And Mr. Cochran, you may uh, resume your cross-examination. So that we're clear, while you were there, no, the photographer never came inside, took any pictures of anything inside that place, right? Not that I was aware of, no. While you were there, you saw a photograph, did you not, of a detective pointing down at, uh, toward the foliage. That's you correct. That? You know who that person was? Detective Furman. And while you were there, did you ever see anyone uh, take or seek to preserve any uh, shoe prints that were in that particular area, if any? No, I didn't. You did not see anybody do that? No. And based upon your training, evidence should not be moved by anyone at the crime scene, isn't that correct? Unless it's necessary, right. And unless it's necessary? Right. Can you think of any reasons why it would be necessary to move somebody's evidence? Well, if you take photos before and you have to get the bodies out, and then you put it back and take photos again. Isn't it important for a jury or a trier of fact to have the evidence exactly the way it was? Accidents and Sustained. Did you see any criminalists while you were there look in the alleyway for any track marks or anything of that nature? No. And you're a well-trained officer? I'd like to believe so. Do I think that, that the LAPD um, did their job and did they messed up? Absolutely not. Yeah, I think they made a lot of mistakes. My job is to go out to the scene and to ensure that the scene is properly secured Notify the investigator, ask for my observations, and secure the scene, make sure nothing gets moved. And any obvious evidence is, is protected. Did you ever direct anyone when you were there to take any pictures in that particular area? No, I didn't. And I'm talking not only about the concrete, I'm talking about the dirt area. I didn't direct anybody to take any pictures anywhere. Did you stand guard inside the house to watch where the photographer went? No. To your knowledge, had any effort been made to call a coroner to the scene? Not to my knowledge. Is it your job to notify the coroner? <laughs> No, it's not. Is it your job to direct the investigation? No, it is not. Is it your duty to watch and see what is being done by the criminalist or a photographer or coroner? No. Do you know if any of those people had been called before you departed? No, sir, I don't know. Is it your job to direct the search at a crime scene? No. Or the collection of evidence? No. So none of those things are, any of, are, are supposed to be done by you? No. And that's proper procedure, not for it to be done by you? That's correct. The jury was receptive to the idea that there was a rush to, to judgment and there were corners cut or evidence planted. We knew what we would be, cops did this, the cops do that. If you don't think they planted evidence, maybe they're racist. If they're not that, they're just bumbling idiots. That was coming. It comes in every case and you expect it. Again, if it doesn't, the defense would be inept. You expect all that stuff. As I sat there listening to Ms. Clark and Mr. Shapiro, I knew that somehow this morning, I would be dragged into the abyss with the rest of the lawyers in this case, Your Honor. In week four of the trial, the jury hears how police found their way from the crime scene at Nicole Brown's condo to O.J. Simpson's house on Rockingham Avenue. It's there that a bloody glove matching the one found at the crime scene is discovered on Simpson's property, as OJ-25 continues. It looked like a made-for-TV crime, but this was a real crime. And I think people got caught up in the story of it and the allure of it. And sometimes we're not able to realize that this was a horrific crime that affected two families, really three families, I mean, O.J.'s parents, his family, Ron Goldman's, and Nicole's. Next witness. Thank you. Thank you, Solomon. Swear that the testimony you may give and should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. On how many occasions have you been requested to make personal notification to the next of kin in a homicide case? This would be the first time. It's uh, unusual that the commander gave me a direct order that I should do everything I could to find Mr. Simpson and notify him in person before the news media became aware of what happened out at that residence. He thought it would be very insensitive if we knew about it and did not notify him in person prior to the news media notifying him. We never considered Mr. Simpson to be a suspect at that time. 
Well, when you have a combination of a former wife being killed, the husband being a potential suspect being in the vicinity, and the husband has a history of assaulting her, many people would see a sufficient combination of factors to at least point the finger of suspicion. What time did you arrive at 360 North Rockingham? Approximately 5.05, 5.10. As we approached the uh, 360 North Rockingham address, I observed a white vehicle parked on the east curb facing northbound. And what kind of vehicle was that that you saw? It was a white Ford Bronco. And what happened next? The four of us walked up to the Ashford gate. I believe that I was the first one to push the intercom buzzer to try and raise someone in the residence. Everybody was talking and pushing buzzers and going different locations, and I went back to get my cellular phone. I was going to call the watch commander. When you dialed that number, what happened? I received a recording, uh, answering machine recording. At some point, did Detective Furman come and report some observation he had made to you? Yes, he did. Was that before or after you got the defendant's phone number? That was before I got the phone number. And based on what he told you, sir, did you go and uh, observe something? Yes. What was that? I observed a spot on the Bronco on the, pass on the driver's door, just above the door handle, that uh, was a brownish-red small dot. And after that conversation, sir, what happened next? Uh, Detective Furman uh, went over the wall of the Rockingham residence. Was that at someone's request? Yes. Whose? Van Adder or Lang, I believe it was Van Adder. Couldn't get in, it was a five foot wall, about 14 inches in thick, easy to get over. Furman was closest to the wall, he jumps over the wall, and opens the gate. We could actually have another victim in there dying while we stand out here ringing a bell. So I just said, if we want in, I just went over the wall. I disarmed the hydraulic gate and I let him in. Now after having rung the doorbell and knocked on the door and gotten no answer, what happened next? We, I walked around to the back, to the south side of the residence, I mean to the north side of the residence, saw the pool, the back of the house, and as I walked closer, we saw some what looked like little cottages or extensions of the house on the south side of the property. And then all four of you stood at the uh, room marked as Kalen's room? Yes. Then what happened? I knocked on the door. Did someone answer? Eventually. Not right away? No. Eventually, when someone did answer, can you describe the person that opened the door? Uh, he was a male Caucasian with uh, brownish blonde hair. I learned his late name later to be Cato Kalin. Cato was living at OJ's house because Nicole was going to take him in at her place. And OJ said, no, 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 you're not living at Nicole's. So we let him live in the guest house. Uh, he was an errand boy. That's all he was. He was an errand boy. Didn't have any money, didn't have any future. I asked him if he knew if O.J. Simpson was home. He said he did not know, I believe. What happened next? Knocked on the room that had been pointed out to me as Arnell's room, and someone asked me who it was, and I said the police, and then a female answered the door. And that female, did she identify herself? I asked her who she was, and she told me her name was Arnell Simpson. told me that Mr. Simpson had gone on a, a red-eye flight the night before and had traveled to Chicago, and that he was staying at the Chicago O'Hare Plaza Hotel. And, and then? Shortly thereafter, a male voice, which I recognize as Mr. Simpson's voice, answered the phone, and I asked him, I said, is this O.J. Simpson? And he stated, yes, who's this? And I said, this is Detective Phillips from the Los Angeles Police Department. I have some bad news for you. He said something about, what's that? And I says, well, I've got some bad news. You're ex-wife Nicole Simpson has been killed. What happened next? He, I think the first words out of his mouth were something to the effect of, oh my God, Nicole is killed, or oh my God, she's dead. And then he got very upset on the telephone. 
And at that time, he said, well, I'm going to be leaving out of Chicago on the first available flight. I'll come back to Los Angeles. And by the way, this doesn't happen. One, you don't leave the hot crime scene. You'd send other detectives. I came to realize that the only reason they went to notify, and that's what they went up to Rockingham for, to notify O.J. Simpson that his wife was dead before they actually have the coroner there to identify that as, in fact, her, was because it was O.J. Simpson. Now, in the history of law enforcement, in my experience, you don't notify ex-husbands of somebody's death in person. You may notify them to take custody of the children, but they aren't the first notification. But her parents were notified by phone. So I'm a little confused by all the notifications, but, you know, as I said before, they threw out the rule book, and we're going to do this all different. Did Mr. Simpson ask you how she was killed? No. Did he ask you when she was killed? No. Did, she, did he ask you if you had any idea who had done it? No. Did he ask you where it had occurred? No. Did he ask you anything about the circumstances of how his ex-wife had been killed? No. Detective Phillips, um, is it your statement that he was upset at that point, was he not? Yes, he was. As you expected. And then he went on to say, oh my God, Nicole is dead. Oh, my God. And he continued repeating himself in an upset fashion. Isn't that correct? Yes, he did. And at some point, didn't you try to get him to get hold of himself from the emotional standpoint? Yes, I did. And he kept repeating himself. She's been killed. What do you mean she's been killed? Oh, my God, Nicole is dead. And he repeated himself over and over again. That's correct. And seemed to be very upset, right? Yes. And you never asked him to come back to Los Angeles he volunteered to come back on his own, isn't that correct? Told me he was coming back on his own, yes. He came right back. He cooperated with the authorities, um, tried to give them all the information he had, did everything they wanted, cooperated with them. Let me see if I understand this. All four detectives, all homicide detectives, leave the bodies out there, the coroner's not been notified, you all go over to another location to give notification to a man you don't know where, whether he's home or not. Is that what you're saying to us? Well, the four of us went up there to do that, and two of us were going to stay, and two of them should come right back. See, but you and all went, the question is, you all went over there. Yes, we did. And at that point, no one had called the coroner regarding these bodies. Is that correct? That's correct. No one had called a criminalist to come out and start collecting evidence. Is that correct? I don't know that. Well, as far as you know. As far as I know, no criminalist was called. You know he wasn't there, though, don't you? He was not there. And even when you came back, he wasn't there, was he? When I came back, I walked up and talked to the lieutenant. I did not go back over to Bundy, so I don't know if he was there. Was Furman with you at that point? Didn't see him at that point. You know where he was at that point? No, I don't. So once he climbed over the wall, uh, you got in, you... We're separated from, from Mark Furman, is that no, correct? No, the only time we were separated from Mark Furman is when we stopped and talked to Cato Kalin because he did not walk down with me to, the Ar Ar to Arnell's room. What Johnny Cochran is doing here is so crucial to the defense. You know who they're zeroing in on. It's Furman. Furman is the bad guy. Furman is the target of the defense. So you've got to get Furman away from the rest of the officers. He's got to have time to be somewhere where no one knows where he is so maybe he's planting evidence, maybe he's framing O.J. Simpson. This is so crucial to the defense. What happened next? I was approached by Mark Furman. He took me around to a walkway on the south side of the residence. We walked back there for a considerable distance, and he stopped and he pointed out an object to me. That's the item that Detective Furman had pointed out to me. It looked like it was also the same type of uh, glove that we had seen at the Bundy location. Detective Ron Phillips was uh, my boss and a friend, but I find that he wasn't um, really loyal to what really went down. He was more loyal to his self-interest, how it affected him. As you know, he won't be interviewed. And there's a reason there's a lot of things he can't answer. We have real concerns that we are being blocked access to the evidence. That's why I'm so disturbed. We 
we have a lot of individuals in West Los Angeles division that uh, celebrity, uh, VIPs, wealthy people. Uh, sometimes their name comes across and the department does certain things to, you know, to help them out or do certain things a little bit more than on a normal occasion. If it turned out to be Nicole Simpson, it was going to become a major news media event. It was going to possibly involve O.J. Simpson only as the fact that he was one time her husband. And it may become a bigger case than the four detectives I have at West L.A. could handle the proper way and that possibly we would, we would want to take this case and transfer it, transfer it downtown to Robbery Homicide Division, who has much, many more resources than we have. Th this would never happen today. I mean, think about what we're, what we're hearing here. We're protecting VIPs and celebrities because we're worried about what the media might say about these rich people who are famous instead of protecting victims of domestic violence. And in this case, eight times Nicole Brown is bruised and bloody. They've got pictures and nothing happens. Nothing happens. And, and you wonder how we end up at this trial. Okay, guys. You got, you got his back? <laughs> you guys ready? Get his back. All right, so we're ready, huh? Okay. It's probably incumbent upon the press. They want to do the right thing to get the facts before they run off with something and continue to try to convict this man uh, before he's been tried. We are confronted with a problem where one of the prosecutors in this case has publicly announced scientific results from spots 115, 116, and 117 that these stains have been identified as Mr. Simpson's. DNA can provide a powerful or subtle association between a person and, and, and uh, a stain. I think that Mr. Harmon did that for some kind of uh, effect for the media. You will see dozens of stains ha that have been analyzed in this case. So this is, there, there are yet other stains that continue to be analyzed. That was false. Those tests were not done. The mistake has been admitted to the judge. But once again, OJ gets hammered with false evidence. To make the statement to your honor and for public consumption, that this stain was a stain that is the blood of Mr. Simpson is scientifically incorrect, is totally irresponsible. Before he starts, stands up and starts to accuse uh, the police or the prosecution of such serious misconduct, he ought to at least understand what he's talking about. And to, to willfully stand up here and make such serious allegations with absolutely no basis whatsoever other than to obtain public spin back in the defense favor is reckless, is irresponsible, and should be sanctioned. It's very, very disconcerting to have a witness uh, who views an event to be fearful uh, of personal repercussions. I think that that is outrageous, Your Honor. As the court is aware, we are currently undergoing significant problems with witnesses who are being hounded by the press. They were relentless. Um, talk about me judging the jury. I mean, everything I did was being scrutinized and judged and talked about and people following me into the bathroom. I had to check the stalls to make sure that there wasn't anybody in there listening to conversations. I was hiding in the corner. Everything that we did was being scrutinized. Um, I understand the need to try to get in information and reaction and stories and um, that was jarring. I would hope that everyone would appreciate the importance of maintaining the sanctity of witnesses who are simply placed on lists and the court recognizes that it would be improper to release not only the substance of any statements but any significant proprietary details about what witnesses may or may not be saying. As I sat there listening to Ms. Clark and Mr. Shapiro, I knew that somehow this morning I would be dragged into the abyss with the rest of the lawyers in this case, Your Honor. <laughs> well, I don't know what, what Mr. Uh, Douglas is suggesting here. Uh, are you suggesting that I gave the, the media a, a copy of a report you gave me, Mr. Douglas? Talking to court, Mr. District. <laughs> is, that what, is that what he is That's attempting to suggest to this court? That's what I heard. It is a statement that is uh, derogatory in nature and relates to Detective Mark Furman. So why would we release a statement like that to the press? They've been leaking stuff throughout this case. They were leaking things before I joined this case. They continue to leak things. And I'm offended that Mr. Douglas would suggest to the court that I will leak anything. Every reporter in this courtroom knows 
I don't leak anything. Harmon, I have just received your letter uh, dated today's date indicating that the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation will conduct uh, the EDTA tests that they propose on Monday, February the 20th, and that you will be doing that on items 13, which are the SOX. Mr. Sheck, any comment? Yes, uh, I think this goes uh, uh, somewhat to alleviating our concerns. Uh, uh, but uh, a few questions. Number one, uh, with respect to item 13, the SOC, um, we have uh, a strong desire to examine the SOC itself. My understanding is, is that there is a cutting from the SOC, and I presume that that is what uh, uh, the prosecution intends to uh, uh, perform this test on. And so um, uh, we would like to have the SOC available for immediate examination. That's really critical. Mr. Sheck just doesn't seem to get the idea that we're trying to demonstrate that the failure to, to uh, show EDTA is present means that it's not there. And this is why we need the SOC. We need the SOC because EDTA is present in many items. And, and, and if, for example, that SOC was improperly rinsed in the rinse cycle, there's EDTA in laundry detergent. Our evidence proved that Office of Van Adder had taken the test tubes with the blood of O.J. Simpson and the victim home with him, unauthorized. You're not supposed to take these home. And that he took the sock home with him. And he laid out the sock. Now, the sock itself was black, but to illustrate what happened, I'm using a white sock. And had taken the blood from the test tube and poured it on the sock, like this. And so, if you look at the sock, you see that it has the blood splatter on this outside. It has the same blood splatter on the inside. And then the identical blood splatter, lighter of course, on the third side. So you have, and fourth side, so you have mirror images on all four sides. That couldn't happen if the sock were being worn by the killer. That's nonsense, and Dershowitz knows that. You don't get spattered blood on the sock by pouring blood on it. That's spattered blood, there's no question. You still want to say Van Adder did it? All right, let's say that he did. He would have had to go into the coroner's office to get Nicole's blood. Somehow get into the office, break into their vault in their lab, find Nicole's blood, and somehow sneak it back to the socks, which were in the LAPD lab, and somehow spatter the socks with the blood. Then put everything back. How the hell is he gonna do that? Dershowitz ought to be ashamed of himself. It sounds to me like, uh, first of all, Mr. Harmon is explaining why uh, there may be results finding EDTA in these materials um, ahead of time <laughs> that, uh, uh, he can then explain away if they find it. Barry Sheck is born September 19, 1949 in Queens, New York. He receives his bachelor's from Yale University in 1971. He is the co-founder of the Innocence Project with his friend Peter Neufeld, where they often exonerate those wrongly convicted through DNA evidence. Sheck becomes a breakout star of the Dream Team because of his knowledge of DNA. Barry and Peter have been friends forever. Uh, I think they've been friends since college. Uh, their families are friends. They had a lot of practice together. I think they still do. So they came as a team. I mean, they came together. They were always together. They were always in that conference room together. Barry, of course, you know, was a star of the trial. Barry Sheck and Peter Neufeld, who are friends of mine, they're bright, they're very able lawyers. I think Barry Sheck is a brilliant, brilliant lawyer. I'm honored to still consider him a good friend. We
we have not been allowed to touch this evidence, to look at it for eight months. I know you've seen a series of letters I've written. We've been dying to find out what the defense did with the samples they obtained back in October. Good afternoon, Your Honor. The Bundy glove, which to our knowledge, they haven't examined at all. If we were to take that and take a cutting from it from an area where there might be a dog bite, for instance, and do some testing on it, then when they introduced the glove, they could tell the jury that the reason there's a piece cut out of here is because it was given to the defense. And that's it that we're not required to give them that piece back. We're not required to tell them what we did to it. Well, you're required to give the piece back if it's still available. If it hasn't been consumed in the testing, that, that evidence doesn't disappear into a dark hole. I realize some of it's gonna be consumed or destroyed in some way through the testing process. I don't think they understood how devastating it would be if the jurors believed that a piece of evidence had been tampered with. If they thought that, they never would have introduced the sock. They would have focused on the glove, they would have focused on the blood that was found. They had a pretty strong case without the sock. The sock didn't strengthen their case. It mortally weakened the case. You know, they've made these allegations about the police department. There is no reason why they didn't do this before, and there's no reason why they should be entitled to do this now after those allegations, Your Honor. That, that's like the um, fox guarding the hen house, pardon me. Uh, I, I, that, that makes no sense. And they're going to have these guys hunched over these little squatches, breathing all over them, doing all these things that he's going to criticize us for having done during our testing. Funny how these arguments are the same depending on which side I'm hearing. Them. Our experts do not have an opportunity to look at this evidence and examine it for trace evidence. And, and I would point out that both sides are correct in this regard. And I'm only pointing out that the prejudice continues. We have real concerns that we are being blocked access to the evidence. That's why I'm so disturbed uh, that a compromise could be rejected. There's a probably a need to discuss something with the court uh, regarding this at, 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 as soon as possible, I think you're in. All right, let me... Before we do that, I'd like to mark the evidence and show it to the witness. I'm removing it from the brown bag. The uh, glove at the foot of Mr. Goldman. The blue knit stocking cap I observed uh, near the glove. Week four concludes with the defense attacking the testimony of the first officers at the murder scene, continuing the onslaught by the defense questioning the professionalism and motives of virtually every law enforcement officer investigating the case. Next up, Detective Tom Lang is in the hot seat as OJ-25 continues. I'm Roger Cossack.